In 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, calling an end to the First World War after the armistice on the 11th of November in 1918. One of the clauses for the Treaty of Versailles was that the Germans would have to pay a staggering 132 billion gold marks in reparations to the countries they invaded and to the countries that fought them. But how could they ever do this? This is a huge amount of money. Well, I'm History with Hilbert, and in this video, how and how they didn't. In 1919, the president of the newly democratized Germany, or the Weimar Republic as it would come to be known, was called Friedrich Ebert, and he was the leader of the SPD, or the Socialistische Partei Deutschland, which was in English, that's the uh, Socialist Party of Germany, and that's sort of the more centrally left party which had socialist and liberal values which ran uh, the at least in the beginning the Weimar Republic. Now right off the bat Ebert will have some very serious problems as he is inheriting all of this war debt from the First World War. Now unlike Great Britain which simply taxed its population to fund the war effort the Germans took out loans from foreign banks and they were expecting well we'll win we'll invade France we'll invade Belgium and then to uh, end the war we'll put reparations on the French and the Belgians we'll pay back all the war debts and we'll be the, the masters of Europe. But as we all know, the Germans failed to win the First World War. So they have all of this war debt, 1.44 billion marks of war debt, and they have no way of repaying that. So you have to add that figure onto the amount of reparations they have to pay. So that's already another issue that uh, Ebert has to face with his new government. Now as well we have to remember that there are challenges from the left, for example the Spartacists rising around the 5th of January 1919 in and around Berlin, but also challenges from the right, for example the Cat Putsch in Berlin the following year after the Spartacist uprising. Now how are they going to tackle this problem of reparations? Well what they really do is they go for a policy called inflation. And you might be thinking, is there a policy called inflation? Isn't that just when you really badly manage your economy? And yes, it basically is. Inflation is where you put more money into circulation, and so everyone's got more money. But if everyone's got more money, then the value of the money, it's worth less, because everyone's got way more of it. So the prices go up. So the value of money is worth less. So you have, like, I think Zimbabwe, that's a pretty failed economy at the moment. They have to, you know, carry around billions and billions of their currency just to pay for really small things. So what the Germans do is they start printing out more and more money, and this causes inflation to rise, and it causes the value of the money to decrease. And the reason for this is that if there is less value on the money, then the money is worth less. And then 132 billion marks will also be worth a lot less than it was before the Treaty of Versailles, which sort of is a slight loophole, but then the Treaty of Versailles demands 132 billion gold marks, which is linked to the gold bullion currency rather than the paper currency. So this is already a problem. Now, there are definitely advantages to inflation. The only thing is, it's a very, very risky route to take, as we will see later on. Now, in 1922, the Germans are falling short of their payment of the reparations. Now, the payment of reparations didn't start until 1921, so the previous year they paid their reparations and it was fine. But in 1922, they're having issues. So they ask the Germans if they can have 500 billion marks as a sort of loan, which they will then pay back to get the German economy going again, and a break for about three to four years, including that they don't have to pay the reparations for 1922. Now, the French, who are the ones who really pushed for the reparations, because, well, to be fair, the French were the ones who were invaded, as well as the Belgians, um, and they just hate the Germans because of the Franco-Prussian War, and, you know, dating back right the way back to the, uh, the Frankish Empire, but that's a whole other video. They are very suspicious of this, and they simply see it as the Germans trying to get out of paying reparations. Now, in 1923, because the Germans still haven't paid up any of the reparations, the French and the Belgians take matters into their own hands. And they actually invade with about 60,000 men the area called the Ruhr, which is an area in Germany, and I think it's the area sort of in beige. It's a bit hard to see, but it's, it's in, the, no it's in the, uh, the sort of northwest of Germany, near to the Netherlands, near to Belgium. And, uh, yeah, and the French and the Belgians, they invade this. And... What does Ebert do? Because another thing that was in the Treaty of Versailles was actually that the Germans weren't allowed to keep a very big army. The total amount of men allowed in the German army was 100,000, and even the navy was cut back to 15,000, and the air force was totally scrapped. 
And so they can't really fight back because it would be 100,000 men from all over Germany fighting against these 60,000 Frenchmen. So that's not really an option. So what does Ebert and the SPD do? Well, he does what he did with the Cat Putsch, which is call a general strike. And one of the things that he does to promote the strike is that he continues to pay the workers in the Ruhr area. Now, what we have to remember is that obviously the Ruhr is occupied by the French and by the Belgians. But Ebert still pays them so that they won't work because the Ruhr is a very industrial area. Lots of coal, lots of iron, lots of steel. So the French and the Belgians invade thinking, oh, we'll take over the mines. Then we can get all the produce from these mines and sell it. And then we can get the reparations that Germany actually owes us. But if the workers there refuse to work, then they can't operate the mines. So the French and the Belgians won't get any money. And to encourage the workers to strike and not to work for the occupiers, Ebert says, well, we'll pay you the same wages anyway. But this has some quite severe problems, as you can imagine. So it's it had a nationwide impact as well as just region-wide. But in the Ruhr in 1923, the output fell to a fifth of preoccupation standards, which meant that the strike was very much working. The French and the Belgians weren't getting the same out of it as they had, uh, as the Germans had before. And the French then turned to actually attacking and killing the local population. So they kill around 132 Germans, some of which were really quite young, quite tragic. So they, they really do. I think they go full out. They have soldiers posted around the mines. They take over. They even try to import their own French workers to do the work for them. But that doesn't even turn out so well. So the Ruhr is really, it's an occupied area. It's a full invasion. And the amount of troops that are poured into the Ruhr from both Belgium and France is increased from 60,000, the initial invasion, to around 100,000 men later on. Now, it also has nationwide consequences. So the wages are still being paid to the striking workers, but the Germans aren't getting any of the coal or any of the steel from the Ruhr. So they're basically paying them not to work. They aren't getting the produce from it, but they are losing the money from it. And that means that also that they're not getting any taxes from the Ruhr. So obviously they're taxing fairly lightly because it was the SPD and they didn't want to tax people too much because then you got more rebellions and uprisings like the Spartacists and the Capuch. But they weren't getting any of this tax money from the Ruhr because obviously it's been occupied by the French and the Belgians. And the shortage of the goods because they wouldn't get any coal. They actually had to import coal from abroad in Germany, which caused another crisis. Now, this shortage of goods made the prices increase again so we see that the value of the money decreases but the prices increase so you'd have people walking through the streets in germany with wheelbarrows full of money and it was worthless just completely worthless instead of buying wood people would just burn the money because it was more efficient so it was really ridiculous and this gets the new name of hyperinflation which is basically inflation on steroids now, hyperinflation, it's more and more money is printed to pay for these striking workers in the rural area, but they're not getting any money back for it. They're not getting anything from it, apart from that the French and the Belgians aren't getting the materials from the Ruhr because, well, the workers there are refusing to work. The value of the money decreases because if you think about it, if everyone's got them something, it's worth a lot less. If there is a deadly virus and everyone in a group, they all have a cure for themselves. Well, the, the cure's not that valuable to everyone. But if only one person has the cure, then that the value of the cure just increases that much more. And it's the same with the money. If everyone has that much more money, the value decreases. But the prices increase because the money is worth less. And huge amounts of money, as I said, are needed to pay for basic things. So in January 1923, which is just before the occupation of the Ruhr, which was in at the back end of January 1923, the price of bread for uh, about a kilo was 163 marks. And obviously 163 marks is still quite a lot, and that's inflation, but it's nothing compared to at the end of November when we really see hyperinflation kicking in that a kilo of bread was worth 233 billion marks. So you can just see that enormous price hike. Now we have this great guy called Gustav Stresemann, and Stresemann, he becomes chancellor in 1923, at the back end of 1923, 
but um, he doesn't stay chancellor for very long. When he does become chancellor, he's called this guy at the Great Coalition because it involved several of the largest parties in coalition together. So people had high hopes, and for good reason, because Stresemann is a boss. And Stresemann, for the majority of his time in government, is actually the foreign minister rather than the chancellor. And he is from the DVP party, which was the Deutsche Volkspartei, which was a centre-right party. So remember, it's not the same party as Friedrich Ebert, who was from the SPD, which is centre-left. He's centre-right. So that generally means that he has a good understanding of economy, economics and gets things done. Let's not start a war in the comments. So what does he do to fix the economy? Well, in September, he stops paying the Ruhr workers wages, which ends the passive resistance. Because remember, they were paying the Ruhr workers and they weren't getting any money out of it. So Stresemann says, right, we're going to stop doing that. Now, in November, he introduces the Rentenmark, which is a, well, it was a, an emergency currency, basically. So it was something to stabilize the situation, because as you could see from the price of bread, 233 billion marks for one kilo of bread is ridiculous. So he introduces this emergency currency while he's getting things back on track. And then he introduces, after this has worked quite successfully, he introduces the permanent Reichsmark. Um, and this ends inflation pretty much. That, that pretty much solves the issue because this is controlled very, very sternly from the government. They're making sure that the value isn't too low, that not too much money is being you know, increased. They, they take in all of this other money uh, from before the Rentenmark and the Reichsmark and they make sure that the, that the value stays at about 30%, I believe. And all of this currency stuff is done by Hjalmar Schacht. And, um, yeah, so he is the guy that you can thank for this. And then Stresemann is the guy right at the top sorting this out. And the taxes went up as well. So he just sits down, gets things done. The SPD didn't really want to tax people because they didn't want the, uh, the, you know, the socialists who voted for them to feel annoyed because of taxes and because they were the working class and whatnot. Stresemann, DVP, not so much of a problem. Taxes went up, spending went down. And this also meant that unemployment rose. Unemployment was, I think it was about 1.7% in 1921, which is really low. But their economy was terrible. So Stresemann, he says, right, well, we're just going to have to, you know, strap on a pair, taxes up, spending down, and we're just going to have to deal with the unemployment. And so he does this. He takes no prisoners. It's Stresemann. Zero stress, 100% the man. Now, the Dawes Plan of 1924 is also important when considering the economy and how they actually paid the reparations and how this changed as well over time. So the Dawes plan was laid out between um, you know, Stresemann, Germany and the United States of America. So in the Dawes plan, we see that Germany gets 800 million marks from the United States to help the economy recover. Now, at this time, just before the Great Depression, which is the end of the 20s, America was an economic powerhouse and it started to invest in Europe. So we get a lot of investment from the United States into Germany. And obviously, this 800 million marks, Germany would have to pay back when they could because it was a loan. But they could do that when they were back on their feet, which the United States hoped they would be, unlike the French, who just hated the Germans. Now, the United States also invested in German industry. And German industry took a massive hit, especially because of some of the uh, clauses of the Treaty of Versailles. So, for example, you have things like that the Treaty of Versailles confiscated all of the German uh, locomotives, they confiscated all of the German merchant fleet, and they took over whole areas of Germany. So, for example, the Rhineland became uh, Allied territory where they took things, and from all the coal from the Saar area, which was a very coal rich area, was donated to France, Italy, and Belgium randomly. And then, you know, the French and the Belgians took it upon themselves to, to nick the, uh, the Ruhr area from the Germans as well in 1923. And the French actually leave the Ruhr after this treaty was signed because the French and the Belgians, the reason they invaded uh, the Ruhr area to begin with was because the Germans weren't paying reparations. So they said, right, clamp down, we're going to march into the Ruhr and we're going to take, you know, the coal, the iron, the steel, we're going to take the money ourselves. But in 1924, with the Dawes plan, it's very important because the French can see, oh, wait, if this plan works, then the Germans will get back on their feet economically and then they can start paying back the uh, reparations, which they couldn't do before. And as well, the amount to be paid was lowered um, and this would increase annually to allow room for growth. So they had to pay, I don't know, 
a thousand marks in uh, 1924 then they'd have to pay a bit more in 1925 then a bit more the year after and then increase as the economy increases so that you don't squash the economy while it's still blooming so we also get the young plan which is 1929 which was made by owen young who was an american economist and the reason this is also signed when you think, well, didn't the Dawes plan sort everything? Well, the Dawes plan was a temporary plan and the Young plan is more of a permanent plan, as you can see from its clauses. Now, what does the Young plan promise? Well, Germany would continue to pay reparations until 1988. Imagine if that had happened, then we'd live in an interesting world. So this is a much more permanent plan, much more well thought out plan than the Dawes plan, which was more just let's make sure that Germany doesn't slip back into hyperinflation and whatnot. Now, we also see that the amount of reparations to be paid drops from £6.6 .6 billion to around £1.8 billion, which is very considerable. And this is the theory behind this is really that the Germans are probably not going to be able to pay £6.6 .6 so there's no point point trying to squeeze out loads. Let's just squeeze out what we actually can in the form of £1.8 billion rather than this huge figure which they aren't likely going to be able to pay. Now, the annual payments increased. So if you think they had to pay maybe, I don't know, I'm just I'm making this up, so don't quote me on this, about 1,000 marks in one year, then they'd have to pay more the next year. But obviously, if they are reducing the amount of money they have to pay in the lump sum, and they are going to keep paying until 1988, that means they need to pay more each year, but it's still less in the long run. And as well, the Allies, they leave this occupied area, the Rhineland, and they promise to leave it by 1930 so that the Germans can use that economy to get back on their feet to start paying the reparations. And as well, they accept that the Germans solely are responsible for paying the reparations. So there'll be no more of the French and the Belgians, you know, gandering over into the uh, German lands and taking things over, taking the reparations themselves. This treaty says, right, the Germans are the ones who are going to pay the reparations. No more messing with it. Okay, so this has been my video on the economy and the reparations during Weimar Germany, how they tried to pay for it and whether it worked or not. Now, as we all know, they didn't keep paying reparations until 1988. I think the Germans went on a slightly different path. But anyway, I hope this is going to be useful. I realize this isn't everyone's cup of tea, and I'm sorry for that. I'll have my Cyrus the Great Part 3, the first Persian, up next week. So stay tuned for that one, as well as some more Henry VII stuff. And then I'll be back to my normal useless uh, videos. Uh, I will also reply to some comments next week as well, back end of next week, when I get some free time. So yeah, it's uh, fun and games. Thanks very much for watching. This has been History with Hilbert, and I will see you again soon.